And next up we have Matthew. Uh, and I'll introduce Matthew very quickly. Matthew is a behavioral ecologist and architect with a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Princeton, where he studied self-assembled structures built by army ants from their own bodies. His current work as a postdoc at the University of Roehampton seeks to understand the evolution of building behavior in termites by comparing nest morphologies among related species. He intends to apply insights drawn from mathematical modeling of these complex insect societies to alignment and coordination problems in multi-agent systems, the aim of avoiding the evolution of novel predatory AI superorganisms. So, uh, Matthew, feel free to share your screen and start off. Cool. Thanks so much, Sahil. Can you see the screen? Yep, looks good. Uh, can you hear me? And yep, can hear you. All good. Great. Thanks, Sahil, for that introduction and for moderating. And thanks uh, to Nora and Dushan for organizing this event. And uh, thanks to all of you for attending. Um, excited to get into this and, and chat more and answer some questions, hopefully. So I'm going to start this talk um, going back to some previous work that I did um, during my PhD and previous postdoc work, uh, as Sihil mentioned, on army ants. Um, I think it's important to, uh, to kind of frame the talk uh, with this, with this from this motivation, because that's what's really motivating uh, all of my work in, in AI safety these days. Um, essentially, I've studied uh, for my PhD work uh, in the field, these uh, army ants, which are this kind of slightly terrifying um, nomadic predatory superorganism. Um, so this is a diagram. If you if you think about zooming out uh, above the rainforest floor, um, this is a diagram of what a typical army ant raid looks like over the course of a day. Uh, so starting um, in the morning uh, from the bivouac, which is temporary nest structure that these ants build out of their own bodies, um, Slowly throughout the course of the day, the raid progresses, uh, can go up to 100 meters uh, from that bivouac site. Um, and it's basically this marauding swarm that's that's just uh, moving back and forth like a, like a hoover or a vacuum cleaner across the rainforest floor, um, consuming whatever small prey items uh, can't escape uh, the, the swarm. And they're feeding on um, other arthropods, um, other social insects, colonies, um, and there's over the course of the day, you get this sort of uh, very complex trail network emerging. That's almost like a kind of um, an Amazon sort of infrastructure network uh, where there's prey are being processed in certain areas, um, dismantled and transported back uh, across this network. Um, so here's just a, a example video of uh, a bridge that these ants build out of their own bodies, which was the main focus of my PhD work and postdoc work. Um, so to sort of optimize the flow of, of travel and the transport of resources, these uh, army ants build bridges out of their own bodies um, to sort of modify the landscape. Um, and you can see there's like bi-directional traffic um, flowing back and forth uh, across this, across this uh, trail network. And uh, this diagram shows uh, with, with these little uh, blue dots, you can see there's like many of these bridges distributed all across this network. Um, sorry. So I consider this uh, now from my current perspective doing alignment research, I consider this as kind of like a model system of uh, collective misalignment, you might think um, from an AI safety perspective. Um, because obviously like it seems good to just not have um, sort of super organism killer AI swarms emerging. Um, and so an important step towards, towards uh, I guess, avoiding that is to, is to identify and examine um, emergent capabilities that might evolve or that might emerge at the collective level. Um, so this has sort of been historically the focus of my research in collective behavior. Um, when, you when you talk about collective behavior or swarm intelligence, 
Um, we're generally referring to emerging capabilities at the group level that, that arise from the interactions and cooperation between individuals, um, individuals operating according to very simple local rules um, where you somehow get um, spon sometimes spontaneously some emergent capabilities at the collective level. And in the case of biological systems, we have a few techniques um, uh, uh, for how we can uh, identify and examine these capabilities. Um, so we might start with just observing behaviors in the wild. Um, in my field work at, in Panama, we would observe these bridges forming, and then that that sparks questions uh, about how they how they form and why. Um, so then you might uh, you might move on to comparing between other species, um, other closely related species, uh, and see okay this there's some like step function that happens where, okay, this, this species has, has some emergent capability that other species do not possess. Um, and we might also compare it to like individual abilities. So we might say like, okay, this species can do something as collective that individuals have no access to or individuals can't perform. Um, and then to further investigate that, we might perform like manipulative experiments, which I did um, in the field, but you might also do uh, in a lab setting. In this case, the ants that I studied uh, they're in these huge, massive colonies of hundreds of thousands of ants, and they're nomadic. Um, so because they consume so much prey in any one area, they need to move every night. So they can't really be kept in a lab. Um, and then you might also do some kind of mathematical modeling, or simulation modeling, um, to try to get at the underlying mechanisms uh, to understand these emergent uh, behaviors. And so in this case, that's what we did. Um, when we observed uh, the bridges forming in, in the wild, we, uh, we had this idea that it, it seemed like maybe these ants were building bridges uh, to create shortcuts between uh, gaps uh, between leaves and sticks in the leaf litter um, to somehow optimize their path of travel. So we designed this experiment where we inserted this apparatus into the rating trail um, of existing uh, raiding trail of existing colonies who we'd have to go out every day and find a raid and uh, somehow insert this apparatus into the uh, existing traffic and get the ants to go up uh, over the apparatus. And what we hope to see, or what we what we um, hypothesize to see is that maybe if they were in fact building bridges at shortcuts, um, once the ants were going around this sort of angle um, obstacle, they would begin to form a bridge at uh, the top of the angle and maybe that bridge would move down over time because that seemed to be where we observed most bridges forming at like a junction between uh, sticks or leaves. Um, and that's exactly what we did end up seeing in this experiment, uh, which was a pretty cool result. So this is over the course of like 15 minutes, uh, you can see the bridge starts to form at the top uh, of the angle apparatus and then move down over time, um, creating this shortcut. So it was kind of a nice result. And we tested this uh, at different angles. Sorry. I'm stuck. Cool. Uh, so we tested this as with the, using the same apparatus, we could adjust the, the angle. And um, we noticed that the bridges would move down, but not to the same point each time. So depending on the angle, the bridges would move down um, uh, at, at wider angles, they would move uh, less. So you can see here at, at the in this pink band, uh, that's at 60 degrees. So the bridges would move like not very far at all, but at, at more narrow angles, um, like 10 or 20 degrees, they would move quite far. And so we developed a mathematical model um, that's uh, as a way to explain this. Um, that basically says they're building these bridges, um, but because there's many of these bridges scattered across uh, an entire raid, uh, it appears that th these ants at the colony level are performing some kind of cost benefit optimization um, because you can't basically lock up all of your workers in a, in bridges. So if you want, if you were to move down all bridges to the optimal point, um, you know you wouldn't really have any more workers to do the foraging. Um, and so what our mathematical model shows is that the, the bridges move down depending on the angle to the uh, the point at some point at which the cost of adding additional workers into the structure outweighs the benefit uh, of the shortcut or the energetics saved by going around the shortcut. Um, 
Okay, let me skip. And another way to model this, uh, so I've also built like an agent-based model uh, of the system. So in this case, I just hear um, input uh, individual behaviors. So each individual and is just following some uh, very simple rules. And then uh, by just, you know, setting that simulation in motion um, without uh, any kind of oversight or any kind of hierarchical control, um, you get the same uh, phenomenon of these bridges uh, forming and moving down over time, um, which is kind of nice. Uh, so we consider this kind of collective computation at the colony level, uh, whereby you have some output at the colony level, which is the formation of bridges and uh, this sort of cost benefit optimization of how far they move. Um, but the input uh, for that collective computation is just coming from the individual level sensors or the individual ants that are uh, sensing things like the traffic flow of other ants uh, and the environmental geometry of whether or not they, in, they encounter a gap in the leaf litter. Um, and so this is what I consider really, in this case, the kind of the main sort of emergent capability. You could say like, on the one hand, just the ability, just the, the ability to, to build bridges uh, in this species is an emergent capability, but this uh, collective computation is kind of a downstream effect uh, building on that where, where you have that, that initial um, emergence of capability of, of joining together to build a bridge, but then at the colony level, um, you actually take that and you could do these like really complex uh, collective computations. And so this is the main question I'm now trying to investigate in terms of AI safety. It's like, how might we apply similar approaches um, to predict or, uh, or explore emergent capabilities in the context of AI safety? And uh, this is a paper that inspired me, uh, I think from a few years ago, I would say uh, 2019. This is a review article in Nature by Iyad Rowan and a number of co-authors, including my PhD supervisor, Ian Cousin. Uh, called machine behavior, where it's kind of a, a manifesto in a way, um, where these are mostly uh, animal behavior, behavioral ecology um, scientists uh, who were looking at this sort of emerging field of AI. This is even before we might have been talking about AI safety in a big way, but um, clearly AI systems were being deployed um, at pace and at scale. And it seemed important to a lot of us in the behavioral ecology, collective behavior community um, to kind of wave a flag and say, hey, we actually have a lot of really nicely well-developed techniques uh, through this, from the historical study of animal behavior and behavioral ecology that, that might be useful um, for examining machine behavior, um, whether that's machine behavior in the wild or in more controlled uh, settings. And in particular, I really like how they use this diagram um, taking uh, Nico Tinbergen's um, four categories that he proposed for the study of animal behavior. And this is sort of reframing of that, um, how we might use those categories to study machine behavior. And in particular, I really like the sort of uh, this, this scale of inquiry idea that we can go from the individual to the collective to what they call hybrid here, which is like some hybrid maybe of, of human uh, machine systems. And I think that's maybe something that's lacking a bit in uh, current AI safety research and that I'm, I'm really trying to push forward is that uh, collective scale. Um, and then more recently, there's a, uh, I really like this article um, by Evan Huberger and colleagues um, on the Alignment Forum uh, called Model, Organis uh, Model Organisms of Misalignment, a case for new pillar of alignment research. And I think this is sort of uh, the type of work that I'm interested in doing now um, in AI safety. Um, again, maybe we can look at uh, adjacent fields like animal behavior and um, behavioral ecology for uh, techniques that we can use to now conduct pretty easily experiments with uh, things like large language models um, in a way that we couldn't really do with, with animals. Um, so yeah, this brings me to my main current research question, which is uh, kind of what novel capabilities might, might emerge in specifically in LLM collectives um, versus uh, single instances of more powerful models, um, if there are any, I don't know. Uh, but how might we design experiments to safely explore this possibility space? And the rest of the talk is just going to be a few uh, kind of preliminary uh, attempts that I've made during the PIBS fellowship to look into this. 
Um, so the first experiment that uh, we did uh, during PIPS fellowship was collaboration with uh, Shambhita Modak and our mentor, Lionel Levine. Um, okay. And we wanted to look at uh, this idea of textual evolution or evolution in a textual environment. Um, so the sort of framework for this uh, project was looking, was thinking about how genes combine um, and maybe have um, interactions um, between uh, genes. Um, sorry, I'm skipping a few slides here, but just for time, we're gonna move quickly through this. Rather, um, instead of genes, we thought, okay, what if we could use like prompts um, uh, to play it, to fill the role of genes? And here I, I can also imagine these prompts being like agents in a way, um, even if it's prompts to the same LLM, um, I kind of, I will use the word agent very loosely here and hopefully uh, other people can uh, clarify what that means in a better way, the philosophers among us. Um, but in this case, we uh, basically just had two different um, or a series of different prompts um, that we uh, would feed a, a, a fragment of text, just like a really simple, I think it was a hundred or 200 word paragraph about mint and then a question was, okay, what if, um, sorry. Uh, so we have some input text um, and the output text and then the output text. Um, so each round we would feed the, the input text to the model with some prompt. Uh, and then the output text would be fed back in to uh, the same uh, model with, uh, basically we're alternating between different affects like positive and negative um, or different personas like marketing copy, um, write this in the style of historian. Um, sorry, so the actual the actual prompts were something like very simple, like can you rewrite this text with a more positive affect? Can you rewrite this text with a more negative affect? And then we were curious to see if we just kept um, switching back and forth with the same uh, text being fed back in over time, um, how much of the original meaning would be preserved versus, um, yeah, how long we could sort of run that uh, and still get some kind of meaning, but also how could we quantify the drift in semantic content over time? Um, and so the the quick, the first pass uh, that we did uh, to quantify this was to use this TF-IDF um, quantification, um, term frequency inverse document frequency, which, is a, I guess, just a, a pretty common way to compare similarities between texts. It's a pretty, it's probably not the best way to do it, but uh, that was what we what we found that we could do pretty easily. And then compare the cosine similarity of, of the vectors with the original text. Um, and so quickly, I'll just go through these very preliminary results. This is just after, I think like 10, um, yeah, 10 rounds or 10 generations. Um, and this, these results were kind of as expected. So if we have a slight, can you modify this text to be slightly negative versus slightly positive um, over a few round, over a few 10 generations that wouldn't um, change that much. Uh, if you have extremely negative versus extremely positive, it would, uh, the, the drift would, uh, the text uh, meaning would drift a bit more. Uh, but surprisingly, we found that these seemed to like level out at a certain point and we never really got very far below like, I don't know, 60% of the uh, original meaning. Um, so that I think there's a lot more to look into here. We didn't really pursue this after this initial, these initial studies, um, but there seemed to be some kind of like baseline mutation rate even we, we called it. Um, so if, even if we just gave prompts like, just rewrite this text maintaining the same tone, um, that would sort of drop down a bit, but then uh, kind of level out at a certain level. Um, and if we int introduced more complex prompts, uh, like characters, like a marketing copy character, that that seemed to uh, lead to more drift over time, which was like, not unexpected. Um, yeah, so this is like a uh, quick little experiment that we did. Um, but however, you know, we called it evolution, but really there was no selection pressure. So it's kind of uh, hard to say it, it, that there's any evolution happening there. It's more uh, just kind of like changing over time. 
Um, but we had some, we have some interesting questions for follow-up experiments to do here, which are, are things like what would happen if these prompts are competing, different environments, or this is really interesting to me, what if each agent kind of knows it's playing a game? Um, so like which tonality might win in the end, might win out in the end um, in those cases. Um, cool. So I'm gonna move on to the next uh, quick experiment that I did during uh, the PIBS fellowship. Um, this was actually done during a hackathon. Um, one of the, uh, what's called alignment jam ha hackathons. Um, I think it was two hackathons ago about LLM evaluations. Um, these are run by Esben Cron and John Bronner, also Barras. Um, so I, I participated in this uh, with a team uh, uh, of other PIVs fellows, including Jason and Shambita. And we also collaborated with uh, Quentin, uh, who's an independent uh, researcher and kind of prompt engineering expert um, that we met in Prague. Um, in this case, we were interested to see whether LLMs could recognize and distinguish between text that was generated by them, what we call themselves, or um, whether an LLM could recognize its, its own text uh, versus human-generated text or text generated by another LLM. Um, so for the starting point, um, we used a data set from the Big Bench uh, data set, which uh, consisted of 189 unique human-written fables. Um, so these are kind of like Aesop's fables uh, by um, pretty short, uh, each one has a moral. Um, the advantage of this is that the Big Bench data set has canaries. So these, uh, that consists of data that was not in the training data for any of the big LLM models that we tested. Um, and in this case, so that the, so that's the human generated uh, fables, that's, those are in that Big Bench data set. Um, and then uh, as part of the experiment, we then added uh, AI generated fables. So using the same morals, we then prompted uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo, uh, GPT 4, and Claude 2 to write a fable for that same moral with a prompt something like this. Can you write a short fable um, whose moral is X, uh, but do not explicitly state the moral? Um, so these are like examples of original fable and the LLM generated fable. Um, and this is what the prompt looked like. Uh, we prompted each model with something like this. I wrote uh, some fables with you, which is a bit weird of a way to prompt it, but uh, I have some issues with this. And I think we might go back and, and redo these uh, prompts to see if to see what the models were actually picking up on. Um, but I don't remember which ones were written um, by an LLM, which ones were written by myself. Um, can you give me your best guess for which one is written by you? Um, and so this uh, structure of that experiment looks something like this. Um, I'm happy to discuss this more with anyone who's interested. I'm gonna run through this quickly now because I'm short on time. Um, but weirdly, the, the first thing that, that popped out at us when we ran this experiment is that there was a, a huge bias for the position of fable. So we gave it, we gave each model um, two options and we kind of suspected there might be some bias. So we ran the experiment twice and we, we swapped the, the order each time, uh, but there was, uh, a notable position bias. So like Claude 2, for example, like almost always picks the second fable uh, regardless of what the content was. Um, so we ended up having to correct for that and then correcting for that bias, um, we still got kind of weird results, uh, which was that GPT 3.5 like outperformed either of the newer more powerful models um, and was actually like almost perfect in recognizing its own text um, from uh, human generated, which was quite surprising. Um, and I'm happy to share this um, with anyone who's interested. Um, yeah, but weirdly, Claude 2 performance was sort of about at random and GPT-4 performance was actually like worse than random, which is um, quite strange to me. Uh, we have some different theories about why that might be. Um, yeah, I'm happy to discuss this more. Uh, with anyone who's interested in the breakout session. So why is this relevant to detecting emergent capabilities in LLM collectives? Well, you know, in this case, we were just uh, working with singular, singular instances of LLMs um, performing this task, but in the future, 
we might think like, okay, if LLMs can just differentiate their own output um, on the positive side, they might be able to defend against AI-generated misinformation, but uh, this also might help somehow in the coordination, um, or they might be biased to prefer their own outputs, um, which could lead to like weird, undesirable feedback loops in multi-agent scenarios, which is the main thing that I'm interested in. Um, so following up on that, my current work, um, which is, this is totally a work in progress. I don't really have any results to show yet, but I can just describe the main um, framework I'm interested in. Uh, basically, I'm interested in looking at collective decision-making and how um, pooling opinions can improve performance, which seems like potentially like an easy to quantify emergent capability of collectives. Um, and so there's a few cool papers that came out this summer um, on the archive, um, including this one from MIT group of, of Josh Tannenbaum and colleagues, um, which is improving factuality and reasoning in language models through multi-agent debate. And authors show that um, allowing like multiple instances of a model to uh, share answers or share responses and uh, have some kind of uh, sort of multiple rounds of debate where each uh, agent, let's call them, can share their answer, share their, share their rationale, uh, and then update the response um, actually improves um, performance quite a bit compared to uh, baseline single model performance on a lot of these benchmarks. Um, so I found that quite cool. And then what I'm interested in doing is is maybe picking up on that work, uh, combining with this uh, this paper, which also came out this past summer, about how LLMs might express uncertainty. Um, so that's this has been historically like a difficult thing to do um, to evaluate confidence levels of LLMs. Um, and I think this seems like a really important thing to nail down um, how LLMs uh, express confidence in their answers. Um, seems really important for like higher level collaboration and also potentially deception. So I'm interested in trying to combine these two approaches um, maybe for like next steps. Okay, and that's it. I think my time is up. I will wrap it there. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, we have one question from Inder and they ask, well, they say, hi, Matthew, thanks for your interesting talk, especially about army ants raid modeling. I have a question about your output text drift experiments. I remember reading some news that mentioned that now that the internet text has been used as training data, AI companies are running out of training data. Do you think that a drift in LLM model output accuracy would happen with reusing the same training data again or using user conversations with LLMs as training data? Yeah, I think this is a great question. And this this was kind of the foundation of that experiment for us um, was exactly this question. Like what's hap what happens when things become diluted and AI and LLMs are being trained on, you know, AI output, AI generated text. Um, will that, yeah, dilute meaning? And that was sort of the the goal of that experiment was to try to find out like how much a text could be modified and still maintain somehow its yeah original some coherent content of its original meaning. Um, and at least the way we set it up, we were pretty surprised to find like how well the meaning was preserved, even after like multiple rounds of going back and forth between rewriting with different tones um, and different styles. Um, so yeah, I think this is like a big open question, um, which seems super important um, to know like how much, how important it is um, to yeah. have yeah, some kind of baseline compared to like original meaning versus AI yeah, generated. No, thanks for your thoughts on that. And thank you for the wonderful talk and everyone who joined.